good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Well, welcome to the IFLA open session on preservation of complex digital objects in libraries. Uh, it was uh, jointly organized by members of the IFLA information technology section and the IFLA preservation conservation section. Uh, the session is co-chaired by François-Xavier Boffi and me. Uh, François-Xavier is head of the IT department at the University Library of the Claude Bernard University of Lyon in France, and uh, is also information coordinator of the IFLA IT section. Uh, my name is Alinka Kaucic-Cholic. I'm head of the library research department of the National University Library of Slovenia, and I'm representing the IFLA preservation and conservation section. Um, so I will be today uh, the moderator of this session, and uh, Francois Xavier will help us uh, with the technical support. I'm really grateful to him that uh, he um, uh, helped us uh, with all the recordings and all the um, platform uh, to set up, to, to make possible this session. Uh, before going on, I would like to say a few words on this session. Uh, in last year, uh, many libraries realized that more and more digitally born con contents uh, that are significant part of our uh, cultural and scientific heritage cannot be categorized to traditional types of publication. Most of them rely on unusual emerging formats and bring a high degree of personalizations in terms of user experience. As part of national cultural heritage, they need to be preserved for the future. Uh, due to their complexity, these digital objects mostly based on tailor-made software products or services cannot be easily preserved. We do not have a reliable preservation methodologies and practices for them yet. Uh, our goal in this session uh, was to localize and share different experiences on digital preservation approaches and practices for this kind of content. Uh, in today's sessions, we have four speakers from the British Library, UK, uh, Stanford University, USA, a National Diet Library in Japan, and Banaras Hindu University in India. We are grateful to all of them that they accepted our invitation to share their experiences with us. Uh, the session will take about uh, one hour and a half. Uh, we ask all of you uh, to write your questions in the chat window. And uh, um, although the, the presentations uh, are recorded, most of the speakers, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, our colleagues from Japan were not able to attend, but um, all the, the rest of the speakers are here, have joined us in this session, and they will be very glad uh, to uh, answer to all your questions. After each uh, session, we will, um, um, there will be some room for questions and then we will uh, continue with the next um, uh, presentation. Uh, the first speaker, Michael Day, uh, is delivering a key keynote speech on the experiences with emerging formats at the British Library. Uh, his contribution was prepared in cooperation with his colleagues uh, from the British Library uh, Julia Carla Rossi, who is a curator for digital publications at the British Library, Maureen Pennock, uh, head of digital preservation at the British Library, and, and uh, uh, Jan Cook, uh, head of contemporary British publications at the British Library. Uh, Michael Day is a digital preservation research lead at the British Library, where he has uh, worked since 2013. Prior to joining the library, Michael worked for 16 years as a research officer and research manager at the University of Bath. Uh, so he has a long, uh, long um, uh, time of experience with uh, digital preservation. Um, I would like to invite you to, to see uh, Michael's presentations. So uh, Francois Xavier, please, uh, if you can just uh, turn on 
the recording. And of course, Michael is with us. Uh, so if you can just ask him questions. Hello, my name is Michael Day and I am Digital Preservation Research Lead at the British Library. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to present a perspective on the preservation of complex digital objects based on our experiences with the Emerging Formats Project, which is an initiative of UK legal deposit libraries. I'd like to acknowledge um, here the input of my colleagues at the UK legal deposit libraries, as well as my colleagues at the British Library especially Julia Carlo Rossi and Ian Cook from Contemporary British Publications and Maureen Pennock from the Digital Preservation Team. In this presentation, I'm going to first provide a very brief introduction to non-print legal deposits in the UK and the Emerging Formats project. I will follow this by introducing just a few of the resources that we have looked at as part of the project. And then I will conclude with some comments on wider collection management challenges, highlighting the need for cultural heritage organisations to engage widely with others to solve the preservation challenges of complex digital objects. The legal deposit of publications has a very long history in the UK, in its earliest form in England, dating back to the mid 17th century. At the present time, the UK has six legal deposit libraries. Through legislation, legal deposit, legal deposit underpins the right for the six libraries to receive one copy of all printed works published in the UK and the public of Ireland, including books, journals, and notated music and maps. In 2013, the Legal Deposit Libraries and Non-Print Works Regulations gave the UK Legal Deposit Libraries the right to claim digital publications under the legal deposit provisions for the first time. The initial focus of collection was on three major content types, e-journals, e-books and the UK web domain, which required the development of a capacity to, to capture web-based content at scale for the UK web archive, which is 15 years old this year. The legal deposit libraries recognise, however, that publishing does not stand still and neither do the expectations of those using libraries. One recent development has been the production of book-like content in the form of apps. Uh, the widespread availability of mobile devices like tablet computers and smartphones means that there is a growing market for app-based content of all types, some of which may have enduring value from a literary or historical perspective. The Emerging Formats project was initiated so that the UK legal deposit libraries could understand more about these kinds, new kinds of content and what might be required to enable libraries to collect, manage, preserve and provide access to them. So these emerging formats do have some specific characteristics. I mean, firstly, they are entirely born digital and have no uh, non-digital counterpart. Many of them incorporate interactivity or other computer game-like features. They also have complex interdependencies, for example, on the existence of external sources of data or information which are themselves also often dependent on the availability of networks. They are also often highly integrated into the devices and platforms required to make the content accessible and usable. So in order to understand some more about these kinds of complex digital objects, the Emerging Formats project focused on three main categories of content. Firstly, ebooks published in the form of apps, Secondly, web-based interactive narratives, and thirdly, structured data, which are mostly based on databases. The project approached emerging, emerging formats in a variety of different ways. So one strand was really focused on external engagement. So that meant talking to the creators and publishers of content, people researching in this area, as well as potential users. The project has also done significant hands-on evaluation of content which is based on a list of candidate items selected by content experts and curators at the legal deposit libraries. 
More recently, the project has begun to develop a collection management methodology for emerging formats. There'll be no time here to go through all of the content items that the Emerging Formats project has explored. So the following part of the presentation will look at a very small sample of the app-based content and one web-based interactive narrative. The nature and functionality of the app-based content varied very widely. The first example that I'll describe is a dictionary app, one of many which are available. The GPC Geriador Prefuzgal Cymru app is a Welsh language dictionary. This is the output of a research project that has been running for almost 100 years. GPC Online, which is a web version of the dictionary, was launched in 2014. The GPC app is a version of the same online dictionary, but packaged for use on mobile devices. The dictionary can be downloaded for free and is available for the iOS, Android and Kindle devices. The app uses the same database as GPC Online and its interface replicates similar functionality as a web-based version. Consequently, you can search for Welsh, Welsh language terms and the results will give you definitions, some information on English equivalents, as well as citations from sources that use the terms. The app operates either as an interface to the fully updated online version of the database, or users can choose to download the dictionary data itself onto the device. This obviously uses far more storage space, but means that the dictionary can be used where there's no internet connection. The app also incorporates two word games that are not available on GPC online or in any other version of the dictionary. These are generated from the dictionary's content and are intended to help learners of Welsh practice vocabulary. Another example of an app is The Wasteland, which was first published by Faber and Touch Press in 2011. It, it, the app integrates a range of resources associated with T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland. It contains various kinds of content, all of which is integrated with the text of the poem, and this includes critical notes, images of archival material, including typescripts, interviews of experts and synchronized sound and video recordings of the poem being performed. The app is not unlike other assemblages of material which um, to, you know, compiled for particular writers or literary works and they and it does have some things in common with sort of online critical editions or uh, things that were published in the past on CD-ROM. However, the, the Wasteland app does seem to be squarely aimed at a sort of consumer audience or for students, and is priced about at the same level as a printed anthology of Eliot's poems or an audio book. The app itself is only available for use on an iOS based device, and the version currently available from the App Store currently requires iOS version 10 or later. And the app version history suggests that new versions of the app fix both problems as well as incorporate new features. The Wasteland app itself didn't use too many features that were absolutely specific to a tablet computer or smartphones. But there are examples of apps that do incorporate a much wider range of functionality. And a good example are the retold children's stories published by Nosy Crow. One of the apps that the Emerging Formats looked at was um, Goldilocks and Little Bear, which is a retelling of the children's story, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This has a very different feel to the app-based dictionaries or the wasteland. Because it's aimed at children, it is heavily illustrated with colorful cartoon style illustrations and animations. Textual content is represented in speech bubbles or narrative, and there are multiple sound options for example, for narration, soundtrack, and sound effects. A cartoon-like location map aids navigation between screens and through the story. The app also uses the device's camera, microphone, and gyroscope to enhance the reader's engagement with the story. So for example, rotating the device 180 degrees enables the reader to switch between two versions of the story, one told from the perspective of Goldilocks, the other by the little bear. There are also many game-like features. Characters can be moved by swiping them in particular directions, or they can be made to change their clothes or to eat. 
the app will sometimes use the device's camera, for example, to make the reader's face appear in a mirror, or will use a microphone to enable the reader to cool some hot porridge. So Goldilocks and Little Bear was highly interactive, and where possible, it did use many of the specific characteristics of a iPad. Other apps take on even more game-like features. So for example, Inkle's 80 Days has been described as an interactive fiction game. It is an example of a branching narrative that enables readers or players to make choices that directly influence the plot. So 80 Days is a loose reworking of Jules Verne's 1873 novel, Around the World in 80 Days. And the reader takes on the role of the valet passe partout in Phileas's Fog, Phileas Fogg's attempt to circumnavigate the world in 80 days. So while managing resources and time, readers can select their own routes around the world, traveling from city to city, each of which contain unique narrative content. And in fact, each reader will, will see a very small fraction of that content. The app is highly interactive, and available for a much wider range of platforms than some of the other app-based content. So in, as well as iOS and Android, uh, this is available for the Kindle, as well as for desktop machines in Windows or, Win or OS X. Apart, aside from the app-based content, the Emerging Formats project also looked at several web-based interactive narratives. While these are based on web technologies, some of them do utilize a specific functionality of mobile devices. So one of the objects we looked at was Breathe, a ghost story by Kate Pullinger, um, a short story published by Editions at Play. The work was produced as part of a research project into ambient literature and is a short story, although the story itself is shadowed by additional content providing commentary from a, a secondary, a ghost narrator. So the main text looks fairly like a traditional ebook rendering of, as on a reader device. And the ghost narrative uses white text on a darker background, sometimes with a smoke effect overlay or some kind of screen flicker. Occasionally images are used as part of the background, one of which is taken directly from the device's camera. In terms of behavior, the reader is expected to interact frequently with the device in order to keep the primary narrative moving forward and also to be able to see the ghost narrative underlying it. Typically this means tilting the device if the corner of the screen fades to pink or sometimes rubbing at the screen to reveal what lies underneath. Text will occasionally disappear or appear character by character. In addition, the narrative itself is also personalized based upon GPS data and um, links to external data sources. So the text includes occasional references to world, real world locations, optimized for the reader. So it will try to identify the nearest closest railway station, educational establishment or cafe. Well, the, the text may change quite substantially based on the current weather conditions. These features are based on links to external data sources, but this will not always be obvious to the reader, at least on a single reading. So from a technical perspective, the app-based content was mostly packaged as IPA or APK files, depending on whether they were designed for the iOS or Android ecosystem. So these are container formats, broadly speaking, based on zip, but they have a highly proprietary core. And that means that we have not so far found tools to, to, to unpackage them for migration into alternative environments. And similarly, while there are some emulators available for Android, the highly proprietary nature of Apple's platform means that emulation appears to be completely out of scope for iOS-based content. Therefore, continued access to the app-based content currently depends upon the continued availability of suitable devices running specific versions of the operating systems, which is less than ideal from a preservation perspective. Even then, the fast rate at which hardware and operating systems are updated becomes a significant issue. Apps are typically optimized for specific versions of operating systems, often even down to minor releases. So when the operating system is updated, the apps generally need to be updated too, or they will be withdrawn. 
as executables, ebooks, publishers' apps are much closer to being software than to being traditional sort of ebooks right? I mean, in like formats like EPUB or Mobi. So, from a preservation perspective, they probably do need to be treated more like software. So, apps will be challenging objects to preserve and make available for future users. The web based content looked a bit more promising from a preservation perspective, as they're mostly based on web technologies like HTML5. Although, as I said before, they are optimized for use on mobile devices running up to date versions of the operating systems. Some also, as, as I mentioned earlier, have dependencies on the continued existence of external resources. The additions at play content could be rendered on, on a PC based web browser, especially in Chrome, although there was the full range of functionality was not really available. The Emerging Formats project, I think, usefully experimented with capturing some aspects of these interactive narratives using web archiving tools. And we just we ran some experiments using Web Recorder and with uh, a curation and annotation tool called W3ACT. And as part of that, the project also established an Emerging Formats special collection as part of the UK Web Archive. The project has also begun to consider wider lessons for collection management across content life cycles. One of the challenges is identifying potential content. Emerging formats content often originates from smaller organisations and they often do not consider themselves to be publishers. So there is a need for libraries to engage more closely with creators and researchers working in this space. Um, and to monitor trends and assess new kinds of content or what new kinds of functionality might be evolving. Secondly, there's a need to be more consistent about collection decisions, for example, on which versions of content to collect, as there's so many, and how to collect them consistently. So we already have used things like file transfer, download via access code, um, web archiving tools, but to build a sustainable collection, we need more consistency. There's also considerable contextual information that could also be captured about emerging formats content. So, um, for example, app description pages on the App Store or Google Play, app reviews, blogs, or, or other kinds of documentation. And for some content items, there may be other ways of recording aspects of user, the user experience, for example, through video. These kinds of approaches might be a way of preserving some information about these content types even if we are not able to collect or preserve the originals. There are many other collection management issues requiring resolution, um, for example, those relating to discovery and access. So we need to know what metadata users would need to discover content and to how to use it. We also have quite significant challenges providing end user access, especially if we have to do this within the constraints of the existing UK legal deposit regulations where we can only provide access to, to content on dedicated hardware in physical, on the physical sites of the library. One thing that is clear, however, is that the successful preservation of complex digital objects will require significant engagement with other organisations and communities. For example, with the publishers of content and the major app, app platforms, so as, as a means of trying to find ways of dealing with digital rights management issues, or to ensure that libraries can acquire objects in their most complete forms, or for support in, in the, with the, of the development of emulators. In addition, it will be necessary to engage with the creators and researchers who actually produce the content. Published app-based con published app -based content is sometimes as opaque to them as it is to the libraries, so it could be useful for the libraries to collaborate with those that have the ideas and create the content in the first place. Thirdly, it will be useful to make common calls with other organisations and communities dealing with similarly complex objects. So for example, museums and galleries looking to preserve digital artworks or those interested in the preservation of software or computer games. There are significant challenges, but it's fantastic that so much attention is now being given to the preservation of complex digital objects. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, 
Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I see there, there are not questions, but I have one question. Um, I was interested, you, meant, you meant, uh, that that um, these uh, contents, these uh, complex digital objects are not legal deposit uh, contents. Uh, how, uh, Michael, how do you uh, plan um, to change or what impact will uh, these uh, new contents have in the in your uh, digital uh, legal deposit uh, law? Because uh, this is very interesting. Um, um, uh, you have um, done quite a lot in um, the research on this kind of contents, complex digital objects. So I think that no one uh, national library or other uh, institution has done so much uh, with uh, branch uh, or narrative uh, literature, ambient literature, how do you call it? But uh, these are new contents. And uh, how do you uh, think that it will have the, in what impact will have it in the uh, legal deposit law in your country? Uh, <clears throat> hello, um, I think, um, thanks for the question. I think it will probably have a fairly uh, slow, impact. I mean, I say the focus of the project itself is really to think about how, what we should be doing about these contents. And of course, one outcome of that could be that these are too difficult for us to collect. We also may think that because of the limitations on, on use and collection, that the you know, non print legal deposit may not be the way ahead. I think it's a, a sign, though, that the, the, the legal deposit libraries are thinking about this type of content as a really positive thing that there's a awareness of user needs and research needs in this area and if there's any impact it probably will come uh, you know maybe you know months or years and in, into the future i mean we have a uh, our legal deposit regulations are under sort of continual review so they undergo a sort of periodic review process and obviously the results from these uh, on this project will feed into into those processes. So it's, there's no there's no definite agreement here that the libraries will start collecting this type of content or start making it available. But as a way of trying to be aware of what's going on in the publishing world and how we should be responding to it. So I think that's, a, that's quite a useful thing for us to be doing. It's we're trying to to think ahead of the game in a way rather than being suddenly re requested to start to start taking a whole load of content we haven't thought about before. So it's being a bit proactive, being a, acting like a research organization. Um, and I think the impact on policy may be, may be slightly slower. Uh, this is really a um, uh, very uh, tough task because we know, for example, uh, any uh, of these uh, contents that um, rely on some software, mobile software, for example, if we're speaking about Android or EOS, um, we know that uh, every year or every few years they, they change the version and maybe uh, it, it's quite hard. You have also to, to preserve the software for this and this is quite complex because not only the software but also the technology also uh, the the experience the real experience uh, this is uh, really um, a challenging task so i, I really uh, looking i'm lo looking forward to the results of this project to see how you, you will solve uh, this approach uh, to, to the preservation of these contents I think, I think one of the interesting things is that we, do, we call these emerging formats. And I think one of the good things about that is it enables us to have some kind of watch operation. So we keep an eye on what's happening in the publishing world, see how things are developing. And I think that's actually a quite a useful thing in itself. And it enables us to engage with other people. So we really work with some of the, the, the bigger museums and we're dealing with interactive arts and, and um, people working on games preservation. So it does provide some links to some interesting communities for us to work in. And I say that some of the challenges will be quite tough to, to solve, but you know, working together, I think is the, is the answer. Yes, you're right. Uh, you mentioned uh, digital art. Uh, it's also some very challenging, very similar. So uh, I hope that uh, we will find uh, some approaches very soon because otherwise we will lose all these uh, kind of uh, 
cultural heritage in some way. So um, just uh, go on with this. Uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, we are moving to the second um, um, presentation. Uh, uh, this hello. Uh, yes. I have one question uh -huh. okay, uh, for okay. Michael. Sorry. Yes. Please. Uh, hello, Michael. Uh, as uh, you said that uh, there is a need for collaboration uh, for in the second last slide of your presentation. So uh, I am interested to know that uh, whether uh, you are you are or in the British Library anybody is working on the ancient Indian ancient scripts, any kind of ancient scripts. Are they dealing with that? Because I am working on that ancient scripts. So I I, I thought that uh, if uh, anybody is working, so I may have some information. Um, thanks for the question. There, well, we do have colleagues working with um, with Indian collections, and if you get in contact with me separately, I'll try and make put you in contact with them. So we definitely do have people working with Indian scripts, and um, we do collaborate quite widely. So perhaps we can I can get in touch with you on that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, if there is no other question, I just want to uh, let you know that the, uh, on the chat you will find the link uh, to Michael's presentation uh, slides uh, and also for the next uh, presentation. Um, the next presentation is titled Don't Wait Until It's Too Late, Can Preservation Influence the Design of Complex Di Digital Publications? This is a joint uh, presentation by Nicole Coleman and Jasmine Mulliken. Uh, let me uh, just introduce both of them. Uh, Nicole Coleman is digital research architect for, uh, for the Stanford University Libraries and research director for humanities and design, a research lab at the Center for Special and Textual Analysis. Nicole works at the intersection of the digital library and digital scholarship as a lead architect in the design and development of practical research services. She's currently leading an initiative within the library to identify and enact applications of artificial intelligence, machine perception, machine learning, machine reasoning, and language recognition to make the collections of maps, uh, photographs, manuscripts, data sets, and other assets more easily discoverable, accessible, and analyzed. Uh, Jasmine Mulliken, uh, who is with us here, um, holds a PhD in digital literacies and literatures from the University of Texas at Austin. He's the digital production associate for Stanford University Press Mellon funded digital publishing initiative. She coordinates the production process and evaluates the technology powering the press uh, interactive scholarly works to evaluate their amenability to current and developing archiving and preservation methods. She also produces the produces the press digital projects guidelines and recommendations on platforms, coding standards and documentation. And she coordinates the preservation of ISWS once they are published. Uh, so uh, I invite you to see uh, the presentation. In 2014, Stanford Libraries and Stanford University Press launched a digital publishing program that was intended to make book-length, peer-reviewed digital projects into first-class academic publications. In addition to establishing a portfolio of published works, the goal of the collaboration has been to build the program into a sustainable model for other academic publishers to consider. It's been a challenge. Authors in large part have not let go of the expectations that scholarly publishing promises both validation and longevity. And yet longevity 
and the digital are at odds with each other. If new digital forms of publications are here to stay, and we believe that they are, then we need to figure out what kind of sustainability is appropriate and what is possible. Print converted to digital suffers from the fundamental problem of bit rot. Electronic publications add to bit rot the problem of link rot as digital publication begets online citation. Interactive scholarly works, a term which in this paper we use interchangeably with digital projects, are subject to bit rot, link rot, as well as code churn, deprecated format standards, disappearing software platforms, and dissolution of the companies who create them. Digital projects are not sets of ASCII files. They're digital organisms with many interdependent parts. Now, Jasmine will explain why we think these ISWs or digital projects are important, though our colleagues on the LOX team think the acronym means impossible to store and work with. Okay. So to answer the question, uh, we can look at a couple of examples and the two most recent of the seven total works like these we've published um, will, will serve as those examples today. Um, their arguments may sound very similar to those found in typical scholarly monographs, but the formats that they're presented in are all unique and contribute to their effectiveness. So Farrell, uh, I'm sorry, constructing the sacred um, in this work, Elaine Sullivan uses 3D technologies to peel away the layers of history at the burial site of Saqqara, Egypt, revealing how changes to the sight lines, skylines, and vistas at different periods of Saqqara's millennia long use influenced sacred ceremonies and ritual meaning at the necropolis. Virtually placing the reader within a series of landscapes no longer possible to experience firsthand the author flips the top-down view prevalent in archaeology to a more human-centered perspective, focusing on the dynamic evolution of an ancient site that is typically viewed as static. In addition to a fairly typical text-based argument with a word, a word count equivalent to about 750 pages, the feature point of the project is the embedded 3D viewer that allows readers to pan and spin and zoom through the landscape and structural models. In the 3D environment, they can also activate metadata tables for each structure and toggle between time periods to see the changes over political dynasties as new structures were added and old ones changed or disappeared. So this project uses the Scalar platform, which is a web-based open source content management system. Um, it's popular among scholars wanting to share their work in an interactive web format where they can reach a wider audience and leverage existing coll collections and archives that Scalar already interfaces with. So aside from the press hosted CMS, which also contains the text and content relationships, the project pulls in images and video that have been pre-deposited into the Stanford Digital Repository for both sourcing and archiving. Also embedded in this project are externally hosted ArcGIS interactive visualizations. So to mitigate the eventual deprecation of the external viewer, all the structural models um, that populate the views and the topo and geographic data are supplied to readers as download for reuse or to reconstruct the viewer with future technologies. Um, and then the next project, uh, Feral Atlas invites readers to explore the ecological worlds created when non-human entities become tangled up with human infrastructure projects. Uh, a collaboration between scientists, humanists, and artists, it shows how to recognize ecologies that have been encouraged by human-built infrastructures, but which have developed and spread beyond human control. These infrastructural effects are the Anthropocene. Stretching conventional notions of maps and mapping the project draws on the relational potential of the digital to offer new ways of analyzing and apprehending the Anthropocene. It demonstrates how observation and transdisciplinary collaboration can cultivate vital forms of recognition and response to the urgent environmental challenges of our times. Um, so with no externally sourced assets, this project is completely self-contained. 
uh, though initially authored and structured using the contentful CMS. The published version feeds static JSON data into an HTML, CSS, JavaScript front end, all hosted on the same server. Um, and as both these projects show, the multimodal aspects not only illustrate and support the argument, but their linkages and interactions, um, even if at times fragile and elusive, become themselves part of the argument. Uh, navigation is, in some projects, more than others, reader-centric, so the reader becomes a participant in the argument rather than just an observer. All seven of our current publications feature unique technologies to highlight the arguments that they drive. In addition, the two shown here, in addition to the two shown here, we've published projects featuring audio archives of poetry recited by speakers of an exclusively oral language, uh, a project mapping the sites of Chinese graves exhumed and relocated to make room for infrastructure, um, and also a project featuring over 450 video interviews with Egyptian filmmakers who experienced and depicted the revolutions of 2011 and their aftermath. All of these projects require multimodal ways to express their subjects and arguments. So books, even eBooks, even enhanced eBooks just don't offer the dynamic potential that these arguments need. Production or making of a, of a digital publication is very different than that of a traditional monograph. In publishing terms, production is a process conducted and coordinated by a press in which an author's completed text is copy edited, indexed, laid out for print, registered and cataloged for distribution, printed and bound. It's a process that can only be carried out once the manuscript is finished and the argument finalized. It's essentially preparation of a book for material assembly. And that assembly has been informed by centuries of practice and a set of conventions now expected by readers. But also inherent in the design of a book is the limitation of its lifespan. A book must be constructed of lasting material if it's expected to persist on a shelf or an archive. Likewise, a publication meant to persist in digital form must be built with longevity as a key pillar of its form. But whereas a publisher has nearly complete control of how a book is laid out, coded, and prepared for physical construction, and can do all of this after the content has been almost fully written, reviewed, and edited, when a digital project is designed by an author in concert with its content, a publisher enters the production process much later in the game. An author has often spent years considering developing and implementing the interactive delivery of the argument because that form is itself part of the argument. In some cases, this development coincides with the press's consultation, but oftentimes it's been underway with the aid of funding that's already been poured into it long before the press can inform its development. In this sense, by the time a project is acquired, reviewed, and transmitted from acquisition to production in a publishing workflow, it's often too late to manage the traditional aspects of production in the typical connotation of that term. Instead, production takes on a new meaning, and it's one that's intellectually tied to what it means to preserve both the form and the content of this new form of scholarship. When this effort to publish digital projects began, we really wanted to follow the print publication process as closely as we could. Though we knew the digital project process would be different, we didn't know just how much. So we decided to map out both of these processes for comparison. As you can see in this diagram, the print process flows in a fairly well-established and linear way. You can tr trace the flow in this diagram from acquisition, which is that first section, through development of the manuscript. Once production begins, the manuscript is in the hands of the press. The author is consulted, but their intervention after that transmittal step is very, very limited. In publishing terms, um, production, the production is, is um, our depiction of the digital uh, publication process. So in this case, you can see that it, at the beginning, there's already been a significant amount of work developed um, and intervention, not just from the author, but from the author, um, often a development team, and perhaps even a designer. The digital projects program honors this axiom from Joanna Drucker. 
in the design of digital tools for scholarship is an intellectual responsibility, not a technical task. So though Drucker's exhortation was delivered in the context of tools and platforms for research, it's equally applicable to this new form of scholarly communication. And yet there are technical constraints for those of us concerned with the longevity of these projects. That includes the authors, publishers, librarians, and archivists. Despite the frictionless feel of digital projects, the computing environment in which they are created, served, stored, and preserved is very physical. Compute takes time, space, and energy. The fluidity of the online experience belies the materiality of its production, maintenance, and preservation. So Jasmine's going to dig into some of the details of that digital production process. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of the steps. Um, and if there are any other questions about um, some of the steps that I'm skipping in this presentation, I'm happy to talk more about it in the Q&A um, after this. But um, so I wanted to highlight first uh, the technical guidelines um, step. So even though a project's development is well underway by the time it comes into production at the press, this stage is typically um, produ the production stage in general is typically pre-introduced by way of supplying the author with a package containing technical guidelines. Um, these guidelines cover everything from what fonts to use, what format to use for media, uh, coding and conventions to use for links, approved platforms and tools, and recommendations to ensure the most preservable and archivable final product. So even though these guidelines go out after development has already begun, it's kind of a checkpoint for authors and developers to go back and review the technical decisions they've made so far and understand that technical changes may still be needed. Um, it's also a chance for us at the press to emphasize to authors how committed we are to preserving their publications beyond the initial release and the typical three to five year lifespan that websites are assumed to have. Um, so, there's not really a formal technical review, peer review of code, but we do conduct an internal review in a couple of different ways. So along with the guidelines package, um, we ask authors, uh, and then they usually ask their developers to complete a technical questionnaire. Um, this form asks questions about user access, current hosting environment, documentation, core libraries and platforms being used, um, and external dependencies and a lot of other things. Um, but since an author usually passes this questionnaire along to their development team, um, usually because they may not necessarily know all of the answers themselves, um, it serves to open up channels of communication between production um, and the developers. Uh, so once this connection is established, then we can gain access to the code or the platform and then begin our own assessment of the project's architecture. And then this helps create an inventory of any technical edits that will need to be done and by whom, um, as well as when and how the project can best be migrated and at what stage the technical cleanup after migration um, should begin. And we've sort of loosely informally um, mapped the migration process in the digital workflow to what's usually consider the transmittal process in print. Um, very loose though, and again, like the timing of that, that step can happen um, or can change. So uh, the, next, uh, the next step I will highlight is, um, well, I wanted to touch on a couple different um, preservation focused steps, but I think I'm only gonna have time to do this one. Um, so all projects eventually get their content and code files deposited into the digital repository, um, the Stanford Digital Repository after publication. But in some projects, we get a jump start on that process by depositing the media assets for the project during production for shared use as both archive in the future and also source files that can be linked into the live server hosted project. Um, this process not only involves accessioning and loading the objects into the repository, but also potentially renaming files and changing the source links um, in the publication to reference the media in its new home in the repository. Um, also, many authors like to include data files that readers can reuse. So we deposit these into the repository as well and, uh, and then provide links to their records or direct downloads within the publication. 
The repository has the added benefit of offering individual media and data objects um, their own unique DOIs. So in addition to the DOI that we assign at the project level, um, each of these individual assets can acquire their own DOIs through um, deposit in the repository. So um, again, I don't have time now to cover documentation, um, the documentation requirement for all of our publications, but I do hope to have the chance to highlight it during Q&A. All right, so in conclusion, um, we are really trying to get out in front of this new form and, and um, think ahead and, and be prepared. Um, it's interesting to consider in about 500 BCE in Kermanshah province in what is modern day Iran, an inscription was carved high up on this rock base and it was large enough to be visible from the road, an ancient highly traveled road connecting the capitals of Babylonia and Medea. The text is presented in three languages, Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian. It includes illustrations too. We might say that this Bissetun inscription has all the characteristics that define what authors want from print publications, prominence, availability in translation, something that's durable, and can include figures. The digital projects that authors now want to produce are far more likely to make the, meet the fate, though, of the pioneer vectors journal projects. And this is a screenshot from that's currently live on their website, right? Due to technical obsolescence and other factors, a number of vectors journal projects have become unavailable since their original publication. Um, and interestingly, even that notice on the website includes a link um, URL for this vectorsjournal.org that's no longer owned by the Vectors Journal. Uh, instead, it points to this strange science-ish website. Um, there has been significant continuity over the many changes in print since that inscription at Visitun. But born digital documents have quietly sort of disrupted this process from production through publication and preservation. This notion of a, what is a final copy, for example, is changing. Tracking digital files remains a challenge. And in some cases, um, at least in, for our purposes uh, in, at the press, even amazon.com as a source of you know, purchasing old copies of print books is relied upon as, a, as an alternative to uh, a digital archive of the files. Um, the move to interactive digital scholarly communication that we've described in, in this paper may carve out an entirely new vein of academic publication that's not about longevity and durability at all, but instead embraces the generative, renewable, evolving, and uncertain qualities of this, that this new format affords. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this very interesting think, experience in things. preservation of uh, really such complex uh, publications, <laughs> because uh, really you opened a lot of um, um, issues now uh, with these different uh, complex formats that you, you presented and that you are producing. Uh, we have some um, a uh, question by uh, Miki Lindler. Uh, is the Stanford University Press Guidelines package for authors and technical assessment information such as question are publicly available? Uh, so this uh, is one of the questions. Yes, um, so I've actually typed the link into the Q&A box. Um, we have them listed for um, they're they're on the press website um they're available for current or prospective authors um but yes they're publicly available anyone can um can check them out they um they've been used um by other publishers like in workshops too for their authors um and they are um they're updated as needed um they're probably in need of some updating as of today even <laughs> um as things are constantly changing and standards are always changing so um so yes please please have a look and um i'm happy to talk about any more of those guidelines um off outside of this too 
Um, there is a question by Kira Nolari. My question is if open source tools were in the main recommendation for preservation as for Stanford, Stanford University. Um, let's, well, uh, not necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. And this is in part, if, if, if what you mean by, um, it's not really that we have the option to make the recommendation for preservation, right? It, that's, that's part of the, the real challenge of this project. What we were trying to, to demonstrate through that diagram is that often these projects are already well-developed before they get to us. Um, and that's kind of the reason for, for our, our title and you know, intention. We're in fact trying to um, work actively with um, you know, the companies that are producing these sorts of CMSs um, that, that authors are ending up using so that we can help to influence what the, what the output would be. But part of that um, is also starting to make a, a clearer distinction between an authoring platform, which might be something that's, you know, some proprietary platform that turns out to be useful for a particular person, group, institution, and it could have to do with, you know, funding constraints and that sort of thing. Um, but that the output, the actual pro project that we end up publishing um, is, is, you know, based on more kind of fundamental files without any kind of dependencies for proprietary software. That's that's really where we're trying to get. Okay. Uh, well, um, then, um, thank you very much uh, for your answer. And uh, really, uh, congratulations for all the work you have done. This is really wonderful and inspiring also for us. Uh, I suggest now to continue with the next presentation. I have to say that, yes, link, yes. Just so you know, I just, I, I did just add the, the link to the uh -huh, okay, okay, nice. documentation and guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we are moving on to the third uh, presentation by our colleagues from the National Diet Library in Japan. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't see that uh, they have joined us today um, due to the time zone difference. They said that it will be very hard to join us, uh, but uh, we have recorded the, their presentations, which is extracting online publications embedded in websites, uh, NDL initiatives and challenges. Um, the, the speaker is Inoye Nobuaki. Uh, he's assistant director of the Digital Library Division of the National Diet Library in Japan. And Mr. Inoye joined the National uh, Diet Library in 2002 and is now engaged in the acquisition and cataloging of online publications. Uh, this uh, contribution, this presentation was uh, uh, prepared uh, jointly with Masaki Shibata, uh, the director of Digital Library Division of the National Diet Library, and uh, Tetsuro Kudo, um, research and planning officer of the Digital Library Division, National Diet Library. Uh, so um, I would like to invite you to see the presentation by um, Inoue Nobuaki. Hello, my name is Inoue Nobuaki. I'm with National Diet Library in Japan. I'm in Digital Library Division. Today, I will talk about the extracting online publication project in NDL. Here is the contents of today's presentation. First of all, as background, I would like to introduce WARP, the web archiving project in NDL. I'll briefly explain its scope, current status, and problems. Then, I'll move on to the main topic. I'll talk about the scope and workflow of the extraction project. 
I'm also going to mention metadata linking, which was implemented in the project. After that, I'll go over the three main challenges we face in the project and some future plans. So, I like to start with some background. As the only deposit library of Japan, the NDL has been operating a web archiving project since 2002. We called this project WARP. In WARP, we comprehensively archive websites hosted by Japanese public agency based on the National Direct Library Law. In addition, we also selectively archive websites of private organizations that have high publicness. For example, political parties, private universities, international events, and so on. These private organizations' websites are archived based on the permissions of the webmasters. Here is WAP's transition in data size and number of targets. The amount of data is reaching 1.7 petabytes, and WAP is now among the largest web archives in the world. We have archived 12,600 websites as of March this year. 5,800 of them are public agencies' websites, and 6,700 are private organizations. About 85% of those archived websites are available on the internet through the WAP website. The next slide shows the proportion of formats in the archived files in WARP. WARP has archived 8.5 billion files. Among these archived files, the most significant formats are PDF, Microsoft Word, and Microsoft Excel. This is because many of these three types of files include online publications like ebooks and ezine embedded in websites, and quite a few of them have rich information with social and cultural significance. But despite their significance, these online publications are difficult to search for and find for users. Because they are embedded in websites with other files. In other words, they are preserved as a part of websites and do not have sufficient metadata individually. That means you cannot efficiently search for nor easily list those publications. This is why we think we need to extract those publications and give sufficient metadata for each of them. Next, I am going to move on to the main part, the extracting online publications project from archived websites in NDL. First of all, let me explain the scope of the extracting project. The target of extraction is PDF, Microsoft Word, and Microsoft Excel formats files that are archived in WARP as a part of websites. But there are so many files in these three formats, we cannot extract all of them. So we select publications by prioritization. Specifically, there are three main targets. First, in terms of content, we prioritize information-rich publications, such as white paper, annual reports, yearbooks, handbooks, official journal, public relations magazines, bulletins, and so on. Secondly, serial publications are highly prioritized if they are once published and collected by NDL in printed form. Thirdly, publications related to the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011 also have high priority in our lists. 
in addition to these criteria if we receive a request to extract a publication we also order it to, to the list after considering the need and the workload one thing to note here is that publication in universities and other research institution repositories are not targets for extraction. This is because we think those publications are already guaranteed to be accessible for the long term by those institutions, and they are not archived in work. Now let's move on to the workflow. The workflow of the project consists of four steps. Specifying a publication to extract, creating metadata, checking metadata, and uploading to the MDL digital collections. I'll describe each of the steps in the following few slides. The first step is specifying a publication to extract. The first thing we have to do in this step is finding the web pages where the publications to extract are embedded from archived websites of WAP. We do this manually. After that, we extract the information related to the publications such as anchor text and URLs using tools that utilize Visual Basic for applications in Microsoft Excel. In the second step, we prepare metadata for publications. With the information extracted in the previous step, we access each URL of the publication and check contents files. We prepare metadata on a Microsoft Excel sheets using VBA2. The metadata is created with a schema called it DCMDL. DCMDL stands for National Diet Library Dublin Core Metadata Description. It's a schema based on the Dublin Core and standardized by MDL. MDL staff prepare almost half of the metadata of publications. The other half are prepared by an outside supplier that is specialized in cataloging. The next step is checking metadata. We check metadata created both by MDL staff and by the outside supplier. Basically, checking is done by sampling and by visual judgment. But we partly use VBA tools in order to check metadata efficiently. In the final step, we upload contents files and metadata to the NDL digital collections. NDL Digital Collections is a digital library for digitized materials and online publications collected by NDL. After uploading, online publications became accessible and discoverable for users. You can search for online publications by title, author, publisher, or other search keys. If the archived websites that the online publication was originally embedded in is available online on the WAP website. You can access the publication from the internet. At present, around 85% of online publications on the NDL data collection are available from the internet. Next slide shows the result of implementing this workflow in our day-to-day -day business. The number of extracted online publications has been growing as shown in the figure. We have extracted 66,000 publications per year in recent years, and about 570,000 publications 
were available on the NDL digital collections as of March 2020. So that covers the workflow. Now, I'd like to briefly explain the metadata linking to an online catalog as an example of metadata utilization in the next slide. Metadata of online publications in the NDL digital collections is linked via API to the NDL online. NDL online is the online catalog of NDL, and you can find online publications there just as you would look for printed ones. We are still making efforts to enhance the accessible to online publications on NDL online. One of the recent examples of the efforts is grouping indication by common identifiers such as ISSN. By grouping indication, I mean that if the NDL has both printed and online versions of the same publication, both versions are displayed as one group on NDL online. In the screenshot on this slide, a printed version is displayed on the top of the result and online version is displayed just below. If we look at light of the bibliographic record of the online version, you can see an orange button. By clicking this button, you can jump to a content file on the NDL digital collection. That's an overview of metadata linking. Now, I'm going to move on to three main challenges we face in the project and some future plans. The first challenge is efficiency of workflow. We are extracting only a limited number of publications from archived websites. This is because most parts of the workflow are performed manually, as I mentioned earlier. We think we need to overcome this limitation through improved efficiency in our current workflow. In order to seek a solution for this challenge, we have been developing an experimental tool to generate metadata with Python since 2019. The tool is mainly for articles in the PDF format. It analyzes text on front page and extracts the title and author's name of the article. The development of the tool is still at experimental phase. But we expect that this kind of tool and other technologies related to machine learning will enable semi-automation of creating a basic level of metadata in the future. Secondly, enrichment of metadata is also one of the challenges. The metadata we are currently creating includes a limited number of elements. We are now considering adding elements such as subject, classification, or keywords for advanced search by users. One of the tools that can be a solution to this challenge is the NDC predictor. NDC predictor is an application developed in 2019 by NDL. NDC stands for Nippon Decimal Graphication, a system of library graphication developed for mainly Japanese language books based on the Dewey Decimal Graphication. From bibliographic records of publications, it predicts a class number in the NDC with machine learning technology. We are considering applying this kind of tool to enrich our metadata for online publications. Lastly, I'd like to mention archiving moving image files as the third challenge. We currently 
archive and extract only files in simple formats. But we recognize the challenge to archive more complex formats such as moving image files. Especially, our immediate concern is archiving YouTube videos posted by Japanese public agencies. The most feasible way for that is delivering data directly from the agencies to NGO. But this method would impose an additional workload on both agencies and NDR. So we are seeking for a way to realize direct downloading of videos from the YouTube website. In order to establish a new framework for direct downloads, we will keep analyzing precedent for video archiving by other institutions such as the National Archives in UK. In addition, we will keep considering legal aspects, including YouTube's terms of service, because they do not allow users to download videos. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. We are very grateful to our colleagues from Japan for this presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they are not, uh, they have not joined uh, to this session. Uh, I have to say that um, uh, the National Diet Library is also a member of the International Internet Preservation Consortia. And uh, we are dealing with many approaches to the um, uh, to web archiving, uh, to the to uh, collecting uh, different kind of publications, uh, including uh, social media and other complex uh, digital formats. Uh, so, uh, if you are interested, also you can uh, see at the website of the um, of this uh, consortia. Um, more in, you can get more information. Uh, there is also a special a working group for digital preservation. I think that uh, uh, you can get also more um, uh, information on different uh, methodologies, how to gather this kind of contents. But if you have any question for this, um, um, regarding this presentation, please send me to me, I will forward to the authors of uh, this uh, contribution. Uh, the full paper is also available on the link that uh, Francois Xavier has just published in the chat. Uh, so uh, we are now moving to the um, last but not least uh, presentation. Uh, this is preserving complex digital objects in the GLAM community through digital humanities a study on ancient Indian scripts. This is a new approach and maybe um, with this presentation, we are uh, also uh, getting aware of new uh, um, problems or new tasks in the, uh, in the field of uh, digital preservation. Um, uh, this contribution is, uh, uh, has been prepared by two authors. Uh, Ashwin Kumar Kushwaha, who is uh, today with us uh, here, uh, is working as a junior research fellow since January 2019 in Banaras Hindu University in India. He holds a master degree, master's degree in library information science and was awarded a BHU gold medal for securing the highest marks and passed the degree with distinction. His research topic is application of digital humanities in humanistic research and investigation on ancient Indian script. Um, the co-author of this uh, paper or of this presentation is Dr. Ajay P. Singh, a, a Delhi University alumni, holds a PhD in library information science. He's presently director general of Raja Ramo Ramohun Roy Library Foundation, Ministry of Culture, Kolkata, 
uh, which is a nodal agency for public libraries of government of India. He was professor in the Department of Library Information Science, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi, presently on deputation since 2007. He holds three, uh, 23 years of wide teaching, research, and professional experiences. His area of specialization in research is digital humanities, OCR, digital preservation, cloud computing applications, etc. So I invite you to see the presentation uh, by Ashwin Kumar Kushwaha and Dr. A. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, according to your time zone. Myself, Ashwin Kumar Kushwaha, from Panaras Hindu University. I pursue here as a junior research fellow. Let me uh, show you the slides. I am really uh, very much excited that uh, we are able to reach the people throughout the world virtually. So here I am here. Uh, I would like to introduce my co-presenter, uh, that is uh, Professor Ajay Pratap Singh. He is uh, working as a professor in Banaras City University and at present he is uh, deputed as uh, Director General in Raja Ramohan Roy Library Foundation, Kolkata, India. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Boffi and Dr. Alenka who supported me to, throughout the presentation, who supported me uh, for uh, my full paper, for uh, other purposes. I would like to thank them very much. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, IFLA section, preservation and conservation section, and IFLA information technology section. So with these words, I would uh, start my presentation. And the title of my presentation is uh, Preserving Complex Digital Objects in the Glam Community Through Digital Humanities, a Study on Ancient Indian Scripts. So let's move on to the agenda. So the structure of my presentation is as follows. First, I will start with the reason which motivated me to perform this study. Then I will deal with some concepts used in this study. After that, I will deal with the findings which I uh, secured in this research. Then I will talk on the challenges faced while performing this study and finally, I will conclude. So, what was the motivation of my study? First of all, role of clam community is very much important for any nation. Being a library professional, uh, it is our responsibility to explore cultural wealth of any country. Many scholars from scholarly community told me that they are facing problems with the scholarly skips because they are just in the form of images and we can't do anything from that. So it also motivates me to do some something which may unearth the scholarly knowledge in the script. Third one, the inability of NMM, NMM, National Mission for Manuscripts. It was a project launched by Indian government to digitize the ancient Indian scripts, but it was unable to ensure all round support for the scholarly community because it was present, because the images were present uh, present in a digital file which can't be read by the computer. So, if I would see digital humanities through my lenses, then it would fit in these two definitions which are presented in the slides. First one is given by Stephen Hayes of University of Sydney. He said, modeling and recording traditional humanities data sets in such a way that they can be read by both humans and machine. And the second one, which, which is uh, similar to my concept is 
given by Alex Savini from McMaster University, Canada. He said, using digital media to explore, create, analyze and decode meanings in cultural projects, current affairs and social life. So the main thing here is the cultural product on which I have been, I have focused. Now, I would like to show you the script image that we have used so that you have some idea about the script. I may magnify it so that you can see it clearly. Here is the whole script. He, they are the characters which are shown, which are written in the Brahmi script. And this script is Roman Dei Pillar Edict in Lubin, Lumbini. So this is what on, or this is the script on which we have worked upon. Now I will start uh, now before describing, uh, I would uh, show you what work I have done and uh, show you the structure of my work done, work which I did. So deployment of first is I deployed the Brahmi script based collections. So before uh, uh, de deploying the scripts, I have done pre-processing on the images. I uh, took the clear pictures and uh, of the images, I went to different libraries to see the scripts and so on. After that, on these scripts, I performed some experimentation based on Juxta software. And this in this Juxta software, I have uh, performed experimentations in four parts. First of all, I used the Brahmi script in the absence of Chexta software. Then I used those scripts in the Chexta software by just inserting the XML code, which is the second one that is before customization. After that, I did a partial customization in which I inserted image associated image with text files. Then I did complete customization. That is my final uh, uh, work of customization in which I manually edited those scripts, those uh, characters which were unable to read by the software, Juxta software. So before understanding uh, other part, let's uh, see what is Juxta software. So. It is an open source cross platform tool for comparing and collating multiple witnesses to single textual work. What does here uh, collating multiple witness and all that means? So let me show you what all this means. You can uh, see this slide. In this, there are uh, two uh, scripts that is Rumendi Pillar Edict and second one is Helidius Pillar. So, this is one uh, uh, set and this is another set. So here we are collating, we are comparing different things between these two uh, comparison sets. So this is what we called uh, collate and compare in the Juxta software. That is uh, collating multiple witnesses to a single textual work. And second, what uh, it is, uh, Juxta is a Java based application that can run on any personal computer. So it is platform independent. Now, which I, uh, now I talked, uh, I talked about uh, experimentation in Juxta. So the four parts, which I talked about has been described here. First one, the document in the absence of Juxta. So we just have an image file of, uh, of, of, of this script and nothing else. So any scholar can't read, can't read it if he does, it doesn't have knowledge about it. Now, uh, secondly, second slide. That is documentation, document before customization in Juxta. Here we, uh, we have, uh, let me magnify it. Here there is a Rumande pillar uh, in, uh, inscription, which has been incorporated in the Juxta software. Can you see the question marks? Here question mark is there, here question mark is there, here there is question marks. So these, these characters were not readable by the Juxta software. 
so before uh, what i said documents before customization in jaxta in this software was unable to read this so this was a difficulty so for to tackle this we did partial customization we have associated image file here uh, let me zoom it see this was the initial text which you can see in the previous slide and this is the image file which i have associated with this file here i have also added milestones uh, with, with uh, this image file and this text file now what is what does milestone means milestone means if uh, uh, attaching the text with the image file that is if we move image file up and down then this text will also move up and down means they are correlated with each other each other okay now i have uh, performed another customization that is i have uh, uh, let me zoom it again see here there are question marks question mark dev question mark question mark na question mark pi but i have uh, manually customized it and it is devan pna similarly this is l question mark question mark j i n a this also i customized as l a j i n a lachina so like this i have uh, removed all the uh, all the question marks or the characters which were un understandable by the jaxta software so this was the final customization which i did okay now let me move on the findings finding what i uh, found uh, in this uh, research first of all deployed collection was less susceptible to obsolescence it means that input file for the jaxta software is xml file which has been suitable for the preservation purpose as library of congress prefers xml as an appropriate option for long term preservation similarly uh, i also found that uh, uh, this study explores an infinite dimension for the scholarly community to do so to do the further research uh, like annotation text analysis comparing two sets and etc so it it provides a multi dimensional approach to do the research let me show what does this multi dimensionality means see this slide let me zoom it this is a comparison view of rumande pillar and helidris pillar if uh, these things were ununderstandable by the computer then we can't do any analysis because for analysis uh, there is a need to under to make understand the computer or the software what is there in the manuscripts what is written in it what is present in it so it is very much important so like this it provides a multi dimensional approach for the scholarly community okay while performing there is a lack of time so i will move on uh uh there were some challenges which i faced while performing this study first was scarcity of ancient indian manuscripts so scarcity uh, scarcity means uh, there were copyright issues the scripts were unable were not available at one place so it was a big challenge for me to uh, to collect all the manuscripts and so on second pro challenge what i faced is translation and trans transliteration work due to pandemic uh, because we were unable to reach to the subject experts so it was a challenge for us to get all the translations and transliterations of the script third was encoding for some characters text encoding for some characters it means uh, as i saw uh, as uh, as i uh, shown in the previous slides that uh, there were some characters which were not understandable by the jaxta software so it was a challenge for us to correct it so it was a challenge last last challenge which i found which i uh, means uh, faced is lack of syntactic and semantic knowledge uh, uh, because i am not a subject expert so there is a total dependency is on the person who is expert in the particular 
script so these were the challenges which i faced now let's move on the conclusion now i will conclude uh, i will xml is uh, appropriate for long term preservation because xml is both file format and text page based self describing human readable markup language that is independent of hardware and operating system so it is quite good then i will uh, talk about the sustainability of juxta sustainable open source project are those that are capable of supporting themselves so juxta is one of them because it is supported by nines project which is a prominent organization which deals with the digital environment of uh, which deals with the archives of 19th century and the digital research environment of 21st century and lastly uh, i would say that there is a correlation uh, with, uh, means they are correlated juxta and complex digital objects are correlated with each other because as juxta cat can incorporate text and images simultaneously simultaneously so it is an appropriate complex digital uh, it is an appropriate for complex digital objects so with this i would like to conclude and say that juxta is a quite good software but it requires some customization according to your needs according to your environment according uh, to the scripts uh because uh, many of the scripts are uh, not in the utf uh, it um, uh, text encoding scheme so there it might create some problem but i think it is quite good and it can be used further for other scripts in the future with this i would like to uh, thank everyone who supported me to deliver this presentation thank you Thank you very much uh, for this interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we see that um, you are just dealing with <clears throat> this complex uh, uh, digital humanities, trying to transliterate old scriptures and to keep them in your um, um, uh, data systems. Uh, I was just wondering what kind uh, of uh, um, um, archive you have do, do you archive this in your university library in your library uh, or you uh, just uh, cooperate with the national library or how do you um, um, archive these uh, contents do you have some trusted digital repository system in your institution no at present uh, there is no such a, a repository for archiving it uh, because i have just started uh, uh, it in my phd uh, work so uh, at present there is nothing like that it is uh, personally in my uh, computer only and uh, in future if uh, it, it is uh, uh, if it, there is a large amount of data then definitely i will uh, work on it this is very important because a lot of efforts has been uh, invested in all this work. So you have to think also forward uh, how to preserve all these uh, uh, contents. Uh, this is very important. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have seen uh, there were some questions, but they were already uh, answered. Uh, is there anyone that would like just to ask our panelists uh, here uh, any other question? Please uh, do it now, uh, just to see. Um, uh -huh. Is a Yuxta performing OCR? Uh, uh, question by Robin F. from Cinematheque Suisse. Uh, no, no, Jaxtra doesn't perform any OCR uh, because uh, OCR is uh, mostly uh, good for English English only, not for the other scripts. So uh, it is not possible for these scripts. We have to do it manually and we have to customize it manually. In future, I'm thinking to uh, work on uh, some other types of software also and uh, thinking to merge all the, uh, all the characteristics which are suitable uh, for my script. So I'm, I'm thinking to work like that. Well, it would be much easier if you have OCR yeah. than just go through and <laughs> it would No, be... it, there is no OCR for the ancient scripts. That is a big issue. Yes, okay. 
so uh, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers. I don't see any other questions. Uh, uh -huh, there is another one uh, by uh, the same uh, attendee. According to the panelists, what is the most important element lacking in preserving complex digital objects? So this is an answer for all the panelists. Uh, we, we can start with, uh, by order, by Michael. Um, it's actually quite difficult to answer a question like this. Um, I think from my perspective, I mean, I think there's been quite a lot of work um, on looking at um, complex digital objects and they cover a wide, very wide range of different content. And we've only covered a very small part of it today. So it also includes software, um, sort of research data outputs and things. So I think it is very, it's a very large area and becoming increasingly important in other parts of our collections. So I think um, for me, it's just really trying to join up all of the little dots between all the different activities that are going on as the most important stuff. And I think events like this are really important in helping do that. Um, and maybe it's the, you know, if for, for our content, maybe it's a join up between the people who produce and package the content and make money from it and the people who are thinking about preserving it and collecting it because there's a quite a big disjoint there at the moment and um, you know, obviously in my presentation I said that obviously collaboration talking you know, um, you know is, is really important to keep engaging with everybody across the whole um, content life cycle so that's really my answer. Thank you. Jasmine? I absolutely agree with that. I think the disparity in the tools that are being developed um, is probably the the biggest lack. Um, but I I don't think that disparity is necessarily um, it's I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think that it's just we're seeing tools being developed by the web archiving community, um, tools developed by um, digital repository and library. Um, infrastructure communities, tools being developed through like emulation and all, all of these differently focused um, preservation tools that are being developed. Um, I think that the, what maybe is lacking but not so much lacking as evidenced by this panel right here is that there is not as much communication as could be, as there could be between all of those disparate kind of parts that are all developing similar technologies for different purposes. So I think, again, I would just agree with Michael that, that, you know, converging these conversations like this is the most important thing to keep doing. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, what do you think according to your experiences? Well, um, of course, I would agree with, with Michael. Uh, you know, as we ended our, our paper, um, you know, part of the, the challenge is this expectation um, that the projects can be preserved as, as they are. Um, and so maybe um, a clearer, under, you know, better communication and clearer understanding, um, even from, from the authors about what the limitations are. You know, what, I mean, one way that, that we thought about this early on is, you know, in some ways, this kind of um, the kind of works that we're trying to preserve are are a bit more like a performance. You know, and and we have an understanding of the limitations of a performance um, in terms of you know preservability, and and that's why we have taken as a as a guide, you know, how to preserve a performance. This sort of multimodal. Um, way of preserving. So you have the recording of a presentation, you know, on, online as a simple kind of video, often narrated um, by the authors, um, as well as this kind of disaggregated version of the materials. Um, but of course, it starts at the beginning, you know, trying to get the authors to, to really um, understand the nature of the material that they're working with. So, you know, it's the medium itself um, is something that is fairly complex. And what we found from an early 
meeting that we had with a number of our authors was that, you know, their choice, their selection of platform mm -hmm. often had to do with what was available or if they had a, some kind of technical assistance within their institution, what that person liked to work with or found familiar, you know, so the guidelines are missing, which is why we produce these kinds of guidelines up front. But oftentimes um, those guidelines are still very difficult to follow because either the project started before already in a different form that wasn't intended for publication and people simply were not thinking about long-term preservation um, or um, uh, that the they're they're not exactly applicable because um, in order to, to fulfill the requirements I guess of, um, of these guidelines to, to make a, a project archivable and um, preservable would require a significant amount of work that the projects can't afford, right? Because it's a different economy to these projects than there are is for a typical um, manuscript, you know, kind of project, right? The the, the monograph is um, is something that is, you know, an author kind of builds in at least in the academic community the time, you know, to work on that. Um, that's not the case, of course, for these digital projects. Often they're grant funded. And so when the money runs out, the money runs out and then you're having to find you know, additional grant funding to make changes. So it's complex. You're wedding yourself to a platform from the, from the beginning. So better communication and maybe driving um, from um, libraries, archives, uh, what platforms would be most viable would be that. Ashwin, yes, uh, uh, from my viewpoint, I want to add a few things that uh, one thing is that uh, there is a technology change. Uh, this is, a, uh, this is a, a very big challenge for us because uh, uh, most of the uh, obsolescence of data or obsolescence of file or anything obsolescence is due to the change of technology. So uh, one thing is this. Uh, second point, what I want to add is that there is a need of good collaboration among the various uh, scholars of uh, different fields because it uh, requires computer science, it requires uh, library professionals, it requires uh, historians, it uh, requires uh, a person from literature. Yeah, means uh, there, is, there is a requirement of good collaboration between all of them and uh, 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 and there should be a standard uses of uh, metadata and we should follow that. Not uh, that uh, various projects are take, uh, following different things. Like I am following uh, some different software, other is following some different software. I agree with that. There is a need of uh, various type of software, but there should be one common thing. When the time comes, then we can merge all of the things. So I think uh, uh, something should be developed. Mm -hmm. So that from my side. And we have uh, another question by Unmil Karatkar. Uh, have any projects conducted any comparative studies of live and preserved versions? I wonder what users think about their experience with either version. Uh, maybe somebody uh, could answer to this question. Hey, I'm happy to start. Yes. Um, we've done some, some studies within uh, this emerging formats project with the web-based data. So we ran several web harvesting tools over some interactive um, um, narrative content and then did some comparisons with the, as I'm running on original devices and what was the result of the web archiving um, thing. So that has been, there was a paper published, I think earlier, a couple of weeks ago on this very topic. So there's a beginning of some work with that in the past, we've also done some capturing of CD-ROM content as part of our older, as our pre, um, pre as sort of NPLD legal deposit collections. We have lots of CDs and floppy disks, and we have uh, a collection of old machinery from uh, 20 years or more where, where we have been, we did some as part of the first stage of that. We did some comparisons between running the the content on the original devices or approximations of them and emulate. So we did some work there. Quite hard to demonstrate this and get to user input, but I think we have done some, the beginnings of some work, we're trying to, to do that sort of comparison work, just as a way of trying to um, 
sanity check that we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there is no other question. I would like to thank you all of you for being here, to, to all the panelists uh, for all your efforts uh, for being twice uh, with us and to uh, the attendees, to, uh, attendees uh, to, for taking uh, your time. And um, of course, we will publish everything. Uh, so uh, you will be informed um, through the um, IFLA websites, uh, professional um, site, uh, or, or through the IT section or preservation conservation section websites. So thank you very much and um, uh, stay healthy in these times. <laughs> nice to see you. Bye.